Okay, now it's my pleasure to present our next speaker. Full disclosure, this is uh, my advisor and for my graduate training and continues to be a mentor to this day. This will be Daniel J. Sandine. Oh, so you. welcome, Dan. <laughs> A few general comments I want to make. First of all, on the screen there, Philip's real. That's the guy. He's in a, video, a stereo panorama in the um, Star Cave, including the floor. And it's, so it's a very powerful, immersive experience that you can produce in these kind of environments. This is in a cave-like system, in this case the uh, Star Cave. And, uh, but everything I'm going to talk about although I'll be constantly referring to you know, this cave and that cave and uh, this wave, but it also all applies to head-mounted displays. There's no conclusions or descriptions I'm giving in here that wouldn't also apply to head-mounted displays. Um, I'm also doing kind of two transmissions, which might cause there might be some confusion happening. Um, this is the stereo projector. You could put your glasses on and get a darker image, but for a few uh, for the beginning slides, there's going to be no stereo disparity. Uh, but when we get to the image material, and I'll warn you, there would be. But if you just want to keep your shades on, it should work fine. Um, all right. Um, first of all, of course, I have many collaborators and authors in this, uh, in this game and uh, a couple of institutions. From the University of Illinois at Chicago, EVL, um, I have myself, uh, Hao Yuang, who's a PhD student, and two undergraduate uh, research assistants, uh, which do a great job, and then Maxine Brown, who was the PI of the Sensei Grant, which I'll mention a couple of times, and is also the current uh, director of the Electronic Visualization Lab. From Qualcomm Institute at the University of California, San Diego, there's Tom DeFonte, who's been my partner in computer graphics crimes for 45 years. Um, and uh, is, uh, was a participant in the um, Sensei Grant from that institution. And then Dick Ainsworth, who I've actually been kayaking and canoeing and doing watery adventures, sailing with for longer than 45 years, and is an, both Tom and Dick Ainsworth are excellent panoramic photographers. And you'll be seeing quite a bit of work by Tom DeFonte in here in terms of the image material. And this is all part of a National Science Foundation grant called Sensei. Um, so panoramas, you probably have a pretty good image of, where, of what panoramas are, uh, but it's really an image-based representation of the 3D world on a surface. Uh, it's not a 3D model, uh, as I'll say a normal VR experience would be in the cave. It's an image-based system that surrounds you uh, in images. Now, there are two uh, dominant ways to represent those images. I mean, images are normally thought of being a 2D rectangle, um, and there's been a long tradition of mapping 2D rectangles, or the reverse, mapping spheres to 2D rectangles. And uh, this is one that kind of looks like a Mercator projection, but it's actually subtly different. It's called the equal rectangular projection. I'll probably murder that pronunciation a few times. Um, and it is latitude and longitude mapped to X and Y. Or if you think of the 2D image, it's X and Y just mapped to latitude and longitude. It's a very simple uh, projection with a complicated name. What's nice about it is it's virtually the default projection in all VR systems uh, for texture mapping a sphere. Another common mapping um, is the cube map. Um, and as you saw in the previous slide and Mercator projections, you get a lot of distortion with a spherical map. But the cube map kind of solves part of the problem by just merely cutting the world up. And each of those panels is essentially a simple point perspective projection of the world in, in that direction. And every image that you'll see have actually gone through both of these representations uh, because uh, cube maps have better uh, sampling efficiency so are used in our uh, compression schemes and stuff. But first of all, if you look at one of these um, equal angular projections, um, you'll notice if on this diagram the green and the red line represents uh, a line projected from some distance onto the sphere, and you can see as they approach the top of the sphere, they get closer together. Um, and even worse, if you were to look at the bottom or top of the sphere, you can see that the 
red and green lines are reversing. So if you're looking at the poles with this kind of projection, the stuff on one side has a reverse disparity from the one on the other side, and in the center it's zero. Now these kind of arguments uh, have been made to say that somehow you can't well represent stereo at the poles. Um, and indeed, thinking about this kind of stuff um, made me do the projection system that I will be discussing in terms of mapping. Now if we look at the cube map, we went over the fact that the spherical map has a whole bunch of problems right at its poles. Well, the cube map has the same kind of problems, it's just on the edges. So if you look at the left-hand cube and you look at the, um, the red lines and the cyan lines or green lines, you can see it's very consistent all the way around. But when you try to put the top on, you're going to have a conflict at either the back or the side. So you have the same kind of problem, but it moves from the poles to the edges. And that should be a hint that, it really, that the problem at the poles that we're seeing consistently doesn't have to do with the projection because everything you'll see has actually gone through both projections. Um, so, uh, in fact, they're, they're really identical. Both are just simple projections from an eye point to a surrounding surface. They don't differ in the information they hold. They do differ in sampling efficiency. Um, and that's uh, one of the reasons you might choose one over another. Uh, you might choose the equal rectangular one because it's easier to display in, uh, in most systems. Um, so, but it got, it's one of the first things that made me think that you cannot get away with simply painting the disparity image on the walls of a cave um, like you would if you wanted to put it on a normal screen like this one, you'd literally just paint the disparity into the image on the surface, but you can't get away with that without having problems. Now I'm going to digress slightly uh, and talk about our image acquisition system so you have an idea of that. And there's uh, Dick and I are on the left and Tom is on the right and the center is this uh, you know, two-dimensional rotary platform uh, that's holding a stereo pair of cameras and it takes 72 images, it takes about six minutes to do a scene. Um, and so you end up with 60 or more stereo pairs, which then you stitch together. Um, and, this, and everything you'll see so far was stitched in PT GUI, uh, you know, a standard um, system for doing that. If you look carefully, as I switch to the next one, the eyes are reversed. It's not a stereo image yet, but you'll notice there is all the stereo information at the top and the bottom. You just saw it flip back and forth. Um, and, uh, and it is actually a beautiful image. I really like them. Um, so next, I want to just, again, slight digression, talk about display systems, because both of these affect the arguments I'm going to make. So there's the classic cave, um, and there's the sun cave, uh, which you saw in the first image. Um, and they have floors, and so they don't have ceilings. So uh, I've had a lot of experience with being in VR environments with this information on the floor uh, in stereo, and it kind of seems to work. Um, there's pictures from inside the classic cave and the sun cave. Now, there's a newer generation of caves um, which don't really have floors or ceilings, but they have high angles of view. Uh, there's the wave, which you actually saw an image of earlier, developed at Qualcomm Institute, and the sun cave, which is a spectacular cave, uh, also developed at um, uh, Qualcomm Institute uh, under the direction of Tom DeFonte and the design intelligence of Greg Daw, who's in the audience, I presume, and doesn't get credited enough with the fantastic industrial design of these instruments. Um, and, uh, and Jorgen Stoltz, who is part of the credit from the last speech, of course, has been very central in the software development that's been used in these systems. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the method that I came to for displaying these things into caves. And as I say, the same things would work on head-mounted displays but my thinking about them would probably be different. Um, and so it's really very simple. So you make two textures, one from the left eye and one from the right eye in the equal rectangular projection. Um, and the left and right eye have infinity coincidence, that's part of the standard that I'm using. Um, and you show the left texture on a large sphere for the left eye, and you show the right texture on, a, on the same large sphere for the right eye. And then you just do the, make the VR system do what it normally does in terms of projections. Um, so, and the way I, what I do is create a big sphere around the VR device, and that's kind of like a classic cave-shaped thing, but it could be any 
any VR device, including a head-mounted display. Now, when I turn on tracking, this happens, which is that uh, I now there are two positions for the sphere. There's the sphere for the left eye and the sphere for the right eye. They're the same sphere. They've just been projected differently. Um, and that's because in a virtual reality environment, things that are far from you move with you, like the moon follows you at night. Things far away move with the viewer. And that's what's happening here. So the disparity, the disparity has been zero in these images, but it gets pulled out to infinity disparity by the projection process of any normal VR system, because that's the way it would operate if it's trying to simulate the world. Um, and uh, any disparity that's encoded in these two images would then get subtracted uh, from the uh, infinity image and end up in the space with you. So it does, uh, does this activity of, uh, of uh, the VR projection itself gets added to the disparity that's in the image scene uh, and ends up producing the experience. So that's kind of how that works. Now, there are a number of advantages to this method. Uh, one is it does a format that VR likes to project. Um, it corrects uh, for head tilt. In other words, as you move your eyes like right and left and tilt, you don't get vertical disparity because these big spheres are moving with your eyes. And that handles vertical disparity even if you tilt your head. And it works all the way to 90 degrees, as a matter of fact. Uh, I can't demonstrate that here because this isn't a VR system. It's a normal projection screen. Um, and uh, it does, uh, so it corrects vertical disparity, and the distant objects move with you like the moon follows you, and it's a very kinetic display. If, and if I were to paint them on the walls of a cave, you would know they were painted on the walls of the cave as you move around a little bit and they just stay there. And so all your motion cues would be the distances on the surface of the cave, right? That's what your motion cue would be, and your stereo cues would be giving you other disparity information. But by putting them on a big sphere at various distances, but for the moment we're just talking about it being far away, the whole world moves with you. So you no longer have such, now you have a bit of a conflict because now a certain distance away where the sphere is, which is large, is moving with you. Uh, but at least it doesn't feel like it's painted on the room you're in. So those are really great advantages. Um, and the reason I went to that method and was happy with it before I started thinking about disparity at the poles. Um, so, weirdly enough, I currently don't have access to a cave with a floor or a ceiling. Uh, so in the cave two, I wrote, I'm going for all these demonstrations you'll see in the cave two, which is coming up, I rotate the poles up to the vertical screen so that you can see the distortions that are there. Uh, and this is the cave two, all the test frames you are going to see are from that environment. And there's me doing the simple and dumb thing of taking a pair of glasses, putting it in front of the camera to extract the left and right eye views from the position. Um, now this is, uh, you could go ahead and put on stereo glasses, though this image is not in stereo. I'm just demonstrating here that notice the two objects at very far distances are at the interocular distance because they're in the center of the glasses that I'm holding there. Just to demonstrate that part of it. The next screen will be in stereo. And the, um, there it is. And I don't know, this should be pretty comfortable. Stereo, people seeing stereo all right? Now we'd expect this, this is along close to the equator. Nobody has trouble displaying panoramas near the equator. Um, and this is Luxor. Uh, this, so Tom Defonte was, uh, was in Luxor, Egypt, and took a whole bunch of wonderful panoramas. Um, for people watching this from the recording that's being made, the, I have uh, black and white anaglyphs, uh, but for the audience here, I have polarized color stereo. Um, so that looks pretty good. So, uh, and you get things that are also close and far. You notice that rope coming in, you know, breaks through the front of the screen. Some people may get a little bit of buzz conflict from the lines that separate the displays there but it should be a fairly solid stereo experience even coming out of the screen. And here's a picture from the ceiling. And this is the ceiling of that same scene. Um, and I think you see good stereo there. Yes? Yeah? Okay. And it even works if you rotate your head or the scene by 90 degrees, still working should be working holding your head horizontally. 
It, I see people tipping their head, but it's not going to work because you aren't in a VR system. You're in a normal display. If you were in the cave, you would do that and the disparity would all stay correct. And then, of course, it even works at 45 degrees, just to know that there's nothing special about the axes. And so here's a case where I'm handling the poles quite well, as correctly as I can measure, uh, at least uh, qualitatively, um, and that's fine. Now, part of the trick here is this. The ceiling is about 30 feet above the floor, so this ceiling is far away. And uh, that's uh, one of the things that makes it work. Uh, so now let's get a little more pathological here uh, with the kind of things that don't work. Um, now this scene, this is about a 10-foot ceiling, and it should be pretty hard to deal with in stereo. It's not being represented properly. Now at the top of the screen, you should be, see some stereo because you're getting away from the pole. The pole is right at, pretty much at the bottom of the screen. Uh, but there is some stereo sensation, and the stereo sensation kind of is in the correct direction, but it's clearly not correct. And then for the truly pathological case, uh, here, this is a house with a, like an eight-foot ceiling, and the, you know, this rig is like six feet high at the top, and so now it's about two feet away. Now this you should really have trouble fusing. I would recommend you take off your glasses and you see what's going on, What's going on between the two eyes is a pure rotation, very much like what you saw uh, in the diagram for the equal angular projection at the bottom, although not caused by that, but it's very much the same defect. Um, here's another uh, pathological case coming up that doesn't work. Uh, you put your glasses on or off, but on here in a case you'll see that the from the viewer viewpoint, the disparials are kind of happening in the right direction, but mostly a rotation. But as you get to nearly the top of the screen, the stereo should be pretty good. So right at the poles, it's trash. And that, of course, that thing there is about, the black thing you're looking at there is about 12 inches from the cameras, maybe less. So it really is a case. Um, so the summary of what goes on is, and then here, but just moving off the pole, you can begin to see the system starts to operate again. So the problem really is pretty confined to the pole for objects that are close to you with the current way I'm doing displaying. So that's kind of my experience with, um, with the disparity at the poles or the improper stereo at the poles. And with this particular display method, it works well uh, for all, almost all cases but besides things right very close to you at the poles. Uh, so there's some uh, conclusions for this, this work. Um, for the real motivation for me agreeing to, you know, writing the abstract and proposing that I do this talk um, is that I've shown these panoramas and they're really wonderful experiences for people. I often get audible gasps from young audiences. They're very compelling. Um, uh, and so I've shown these panoramas to thousands of people. That's not an exaggeration. Um, and nobody's complained about the stereo on the floor. Uh, even people who know about stereo haven't. And so I was trying to, the reason I agreed to do this is I'm trying to figure out why in the world it worked. And I hadn't given the matter enough thought. Um, and so, uh, so why does it seem to work? Well, the main reason it seems to work is the fact that your feet cover up the problem. Because remember, the, the spheres, the whole world moves with you and that means the poles are directly under your feet, and so you kind of don't see them. And then just as the minute you get off from the poles, things are getting better, and that crossover you saw doesn't operate because you're always facing the right direction, because you're always facing away from the pole, because the VR device itself is taking these spheres and putting them right along with you. So that's kind of why it works. But probably the major takeaway from from it is that there are problems at the poles with many display methods, including the one that I use. Um, so um, that was just a repeat of what I said there with our VR display method. It works well for everything but things close to you at the poles. And so I'm not making any claims about this method that I use as being the best. And I'm not making any claims that there is not a perfect solution. I just haven't found it. If you have, please let me know. I am claiming that the equal rectangular projection is not the problem, although I have not in this talk provided good arguments for that. In the paper, I'll 
try to get those well thought out. And in the, case, the problems that we are seeing, to me, is, by my analysis, is not about the poles. It's the, about the arrangement of cameras and the way the stitching is done. It's what's setting that directional problem is the fact that the cameras are all rotating around, you know, a vertical line. And so with a different cam, with, a, with an either, either a different stitching arrangement or a different arrangement of cameras would be more successful. Um, one probably can correct this problem. But the kind of uh, panoramas that we are doing is uh, pretty much what everybody's doing. So I just wanted to let you see, say a goodbye there from Luxor, Egypt, and hope sometime you get to one of the many caves uh, which have, uh, have this displayed in. Or if you have a cave and you would like to display these images, and it certainly can be arranged. Thank you very much.